Hello, everyone. We have here today Dr. Selvin, a teacher and a lecturer of mine when I was at high school. Selvin is someone whom I've admired a lot. A brief introduction about him. It is hard to overestimate the achievements that he has attained. He was valedictorian in the University of British Columbia, UBC, and he also inspired me to apply to UBC as well. And he now holds a PhD in educational psychology in a renowned local university here in Malaysia. And he also right now is a lecturer in one of the most renowned private universities here in Malaysia. So Selvan, welcome. Thank you, Ken. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. It is my pleasure to be able to speak to you. Like I mentioned, Selvan, today I really wanted to explore more about yourself because I feel that you are a very inspirational, inspirational figure, not just to myself, but to my colleagues in school and coincidentally in my work as well. So in my previous company, as I've mentioned to you many times, my colleague speaks very highly of you. So I'm sure a lot of people want to find out more about you. So, and I also know that Selvin does not come from the most fortunate background. And I think that it is not very common for people of less privileged backgrounds to attain the type of achievements that he has attained. Matter of fact, it is not very common for anyone from any background to be able to attain the, the type of achievements and to, to possess the type of drive that he has. So why don't you share with us a little bit, Selvin, about how you motivate yourself on a daily basis? Um, you could start from when you were young or really anywhere. All righty. Um, you, you are very kind uh, with your words. Thank you. And I, I'm pretty sure that there are many individuals out there uh, who have similar journeys uh, and drives of their own. Um, but in my case, um, th there are a couple of things. So when I, I was young, the motivation was primarily getting out of poverty. That was my motivation. Um, so I'm from um, a social economically disadvantaged back, uh, background, um, and I, I grew up with very little. Um, so there are two motivators. This may sound silly, but as I reflect back, uh, those were the two uh, primary motivators uh, when I was in primary school. Um, one is to avoid mosquitoes. Uh, the other is to um, avoid hot sun. Um, so we, I, I grew up in a village um, and my uh, parents were rubber tappers uh, at the time. And we will go out um, to help them um, during weekends mostly, but sometimes um, weekday uh, evenings. Um, and these places flooded uh, with mosquitoes. Um, so I, I understood the rationale um, of us going uh, and the value in helping out. All of those were good. I, I know how hard um, both my parents worked in order to uh, raise us, right? So all of those are appreciated. Um, really, really fancy uh, that the mosquito bites, they will just hunt you. Um, and then there were many uh, instances where I, I'll secretly cry because it was just very uh, painful at that time. Like I, uh, I, I knew that I needed to get up. Um, and the other is like walking back from school. So I, I, I take a, um, I, I took school bus, um, but there, there is a fair bit of um, walking. Uh, not, not in kilometers, but I, I was a small boy. Um, so any, any amount of hot weather um, was not fantastic. Um, and I, I also didn't like walking uh, under the sun. So for those were the two motivators. And at that time I was thinking, I need to escape this uh, <laughs> as soon as possible. Um, and all uh, that I, I knew um, that I had at that time is education. Um, and of course I had excellent teachers throughout uh, my educational journey. Um, and they they were also motivating me in that regard, right? So we, we need to get out of this situation, and the only way to do it is to excel in education. Um, so that was 
where I started. After that, of course, as I grew older, there were other uh, motivators. Um, as, as cliche as it sounds, uh, I, I knew that I, I wanted to teach um, even when I was in primary, towards the end of primary and then secondary, certainly. Uh, a lot of it was the, the inspiration that I got from my teachers. I, I knew that I won't be here today without them uh, nurturing me throughout. So it, it is just uh, me trying to play the same role. Even if I do half as much, I would be very happy with my life. You're very humble, yeah. Salvin. I I don't think the mention the things that you mentioned were silly. If anything, I think they are very psychologically, evolutionarily psychological because I think we know that we are more sensitive to negative emotions as opposed to positive emotions. I would say that I did not come from a similar background, in fact, a vastly dissimilar. So I, I was very privileged in that sense compared to yourself. So my motivation primarily were positive rewards as opposed to mm -hmm. negative punishments. Mm -hmm. So it would it had been easier for me to to be complacent from time to time. And I think for yourself it would be very different because you're running away from a punishment as opposed to mm -hmm. chasing after a reward. Mm, I wanted to ask, so you mentioned that you didn't have anything else aside from education. Was there a time during your school days when you realized, hey, I'm actually pretty good at just education. I'm pretty good at scoring well in exams and learning the materials and so forth. Yeah, um, I think so. I think that that was there uh, earlier. Uh, there, there were certainly subjects that I, I really didn't enjoy uh, and I, I struggled a little. Um, but mo for the most part, I, I, I liked the, the core subjects. I think I, I really liked all languages. Uh, I liked math uh, quite a bit um, and a range of uh, other subjects. So even in primary school, I was able to uh, master the materials quite a bit. Um, I, I don't think I have a whole lot of natural intelligence, uh, but I, I did put in no, my so. best. <laughs> no, uh, I, I, <laughs> uh, I think that my, my effort um, is bigger in, in regards to the proportion. Um, so I, I put in best effort uh, throughout. Um, and they, they obviously will be rewarded. Um, so one you you can see uh, in the grades. Uh, so of course you you get that affirmation from teachers. Um, so I, I didn't have um, that many support outside education um, school contacts. Uh, but that, that I, I did pick that up. I think and man, certainly made me feel really good about that. Um, and that I, I wanted to sustain that bit of it excelling um and i'm not i i'm i was from a very small school so there are not that many students even in, in standard six there were only i think about 13 of us uh, and that's only one class um of standard six for instance so um it, it wasn't that big so in that regard it's not a major achievement but i love when i was doing well and being on top of the class um, I, I felt really good so that and mostly because um, I put in the effort and that was reflected. Right, right, right. And I wanted to ask a little bit about your village as well. Do you come from a more Chinese village and you were one of the few, I think, Indians there or something like that? I think you've mentioned that before to me previously. Um, yeah, so, so the, the, the area that I, I was uh, living within the village. Yes, they were, they were surrounded uh, by more uh, Chinese than other ethnic groups. But if, when we look at the entire uh, village area, it, it is multicultural uh, oh, right. in that regard. So uh, it, it depends on the geographical location. So um, people from Malay ethnicity, they were closer to the seaside and then uh, there the were uh, Chinese were closer to um, the plantations. Of course, Indians were helping them, and that the, some Indians were also um, fishermen. Um, so that that was the uh, background. So I think I interacted more with Chinese simply because they were closer. Uh, but that, that village had other ethnic groups as well. Right, right, right. So typically in shows, the the boy who is physically frail and 
verbally fluent and intelligent would be the ones who are probably a lot. Have you experienced any bullying before? I don't think so. Maybe, no. yeah. Uh, I, I could I could put up a front. I'm brave, <laughs> this brave person. Um, no, I don't. No, there there were remarks asked, um, that, but mostly they don't bother me. But even if they bother, I won't show that. Uh, I'll I'll put up that front so that that will scare them away. Um, but in in secondary, you know, I, I think I was fortunate in that regard. So even though I was very small in size, I still am. Uh, but um, I, I didn't experience it. Yeah. Mm, 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 mm. Okay. So you come from a small school, and then when you were in college, you went to the city, and I believe mm -hmm. that would have been a much bigger institution compared to the schools that you were in. How did you feel when you went there? Well, to a different city and then to a march, much more large scale institution as well, meeting people from different backgrounds and so forth. Yeah, um, I was thrilled, obviously, because this is all that I wanted to escape uh, for the past 11 years. Um, so I. I really enjoyed uh, my college days, um, both while I was doing pre-university as well as uh, undergraduate studies. Um, so obviously it was different from the environment that I was used to, but city uh, was what I was hoping for. Um, so obviously now that I'm much older, um, I see the problems with city life, and now I want to find a place where somewhere middle, uh, not full village, not full city. Um, but at that time, I enjoyed it. Um, and I, um, I, I was, um, I think I like to believe that I'm quite adaptable. Um, so I, I was able to fit in and anything new, uh, I'll just embracing it because that's, that's what I was looking forward to. Mm, 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 mm. So as thrilled as you were, did you become more extroverted because you You've mentioned to me before that you tend to be more introverted and speaking with people would drain you. <laughs> mm. And that's still true today. Uh, and I think I, I can uh, be a little more extroverted when the situation demands it. Um, but other than that, I, I think I was still um, quite introverted. Uh, so I, 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 I explored, but not necessarily going out of the way uh, in regards to social interactions, because that part of me was still uh, through um, social interactions, drain my energy. So I need to be more cautious um, in regards to the energy being spent. Right, right. Okay, I think this is where I see how we differ a lot, because when you mentioned mm -hmm. the word thrill, what I, the first thing that came to my mind was people, mm -hmm. meeting with people and so forth. So what, was it about the city and the institutions that thrilled you, if not the people? Ah, uh, I, I think it's the comfort of the city. Um, mm. So still today, one of the major things that I, I want in life is comfort. I, I don't like pain. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I like to think that I've, I've experienced it enough, no more. Um, so the, the fact that you, you can have more air conditioned uh, places, uh, smoother roads, uh, so these basic stuff um, that I not, didn't necessarily have. Um, I think that 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 was what I was embracing, um, the more comfortable uh, life than what I was used to. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. If, if anything, people-wise, I, I I don't think it was a whole lot of difference. Um, I, I was still going with the same level of interaction that I had uh, earlier. All right, so not a lot of interactions, that is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah. All right. And then you went on to venture into psychology, which is not the most traditional major or subject that any that people would major in. How mm. did your parents feel about that? Or did they not care? As long as you were going to university, they were happy. Uh, of course, they, they were very happy um, that uh, I was going to university. And of course, I was going abroad. Uh, that That's a big thing. The, the entire plan, um, I, I would say. Um, but psychology itself, um, it's it's kind. Of, I, I chose that to appease my parents to a certain extent. 
because I'm from an Indian family um, and uh, two traditional Indian jobs. You either be a doctor or a lawyer. Uh, so of course, there, there were that expectation uh, and there was a push uh, both from my uh, teachers as well as family uh, to go into uh, medicine. Um, I, I don't fancy the field, nothing against the fellow, it's a noble profession, but I don't think I even have the heart for it. Uh, I can't even stand uh, the medical procedures in general without getting anxious. Um, so it's just not for me. Um, and also there were other things that I was more interested in teaching as being a, a profession that I, I really wanted to go into. And I, I knew that no matter which specialization I go into, teaching would be something that I would do together with the main uh, profession. Um, so because psychology was seen as still health related, um, they were pretty okay with it, right? So that <laughs> I would still be a doctor. Um, so, and then of course, they, they were very happy that I was going um, to university. Yeah. So there was right. no major uh, opposition for that matter. So now that you have attained your PhD, do they go around telling people that my son is a doctor? I'm not sure, but I, I won't be surprised <laughs> if, if they <laughs> do. Um, yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. So at UBC, I would love to know more about your time at UBC because I was also at UBC, I think about a 10 year difference. So I'd, I'd love to see what the difference would be, how our experience was like. And given that our personality differs quite a bit, especially on the end of extroversion, I would love to see the type of activities that you explored and how you felt really. Um, I'm not sure how prone you were to homesickness, given mm -hmm. that you are very adaptable, as you've mentioned, or at least you like to think so. Yeah. But I was very homesick and I needed to speak with and interact with a lot of people to feel better when I was there. It was my first time going abroad as well. So, and leaving my family. And I think Canada would be as far as it yeah. is from Malaysia. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I think for me, uh, overall, it was a fantastic experience. I, I loved every bit of it, except two things. Um, one is weather. The, the constant drizzling was not for me. Uh, and the food, obviously, it can't beat Malaysian food. Uh, those were the only two uh, things that I, I didn't fancy. Everything else about UBC and the place in general, um, I, I, I loved every bit of it. Um, so it was good. Um, in terms of homesickness, I think that the first week was really tough because I was going with an impression that I would not be able to come back for the next four years. Right? So I, I was, the only reason why I was able to go there was because I was under scholarship. Uh, and then the scholarship term um, is that they will pay. The, the the ticket to and ticket from to Canada and from Canada. So those would be the two tickets. Um, so I was under that impression. Obviously, I was able to find funds to come back in between after. But at that time, I, I didn't have that. So that was really uh, difficult. Um, as much as I, I keep my social interactions limited, um, I, I do need my immediate uh, family. I don't have to talk to them all the time, but I need to at least see them um, because I, I need the assurance that they are doing OK. Um, they mm -hmm. really matter to me. So that was tough. Um, but after that, um, it, it got better so that I, I would be able to do uh, just OK, uh, even if we are only uh, talking over the phone once a week, uh, for instance. So it, it got better. Um, I think as long as I'm doing something, that I like. It could be just reading textbook, which I like. Uh, I'll be fine. So I don't necessarily need to uh, have a whole lot of social interactions. Um, however, um, I, I don't want to be all uh, alone all times. So I, I was quite involved um, throughout my undergraduate years. So whether it's a research lab or um, clubs, um, I was involved, but it's yeah, I, I will schedule it in a way that, OK, on Friday night, I can afford to go out and interact because I'll be able to rest. 
because I know that the moment I have lengthy social interactions, I'm going to be so drained that I don't have energy to do anything else. Um, so I, I will make sure that. Sorry, we're having this call on this Friday yeah. night. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I'll be able to rest. But I think I think for you, Ken, it's different. You will be able to get more energy and be more energized probably after social interactions. It's so it has the opposite effect on me. Uh, it's not that I don't enjoy it. Um, there are, I, I want to keep my interactions limited and meaningful. Uh, I, I do enjoy them. It's just very draining, uh, regardless of the nature of uh, conversation. Just, yeah. Um, so in that regard, I, I was having these, um, and very rarely after I, I felt uh, homesick, I was able to adapt and embrace whatever experiences that I was getting while I was there. Right, right, right. So, okay, so given all of that, and then with your your profession right now, do you see that there's a divergence between yourself and perhaps your friends whom you met when you were back in the village? Yeah, uh, the, I think we, we are on different uh, paths. So uh, some people back in the village, um, they, may, they may not have had similar push um, either within themselves or uh, outside. Um, so they might have been entirely okay um, with their current state of life. Uh, there's nothing um, inferior about uh, village life, uh, whether it's plantation, um, etc. cetera. Um, but in terms of what we look forward to in, in life uh, and what we want to um, get to, they, they may, that may differ. Um, I, I did feel like for the most part, I was not able to have similar conversations or conversation that I want to have um, with fellow people. Um, I, I'm not entirely attached uh, to people uh, in the village. I, probably I, I have more quality conversations with older persons in the village than people of my age. Um, and that, that's because of the, the things that we were looking uh, forward to, I think. Um, so I, I was all about getting out uh, and making an impact. Uh, so they may not uh, necessarily see it that way. They may have been entirely content with their uh, current life, which is totally fair. Uh, but that, that was the state. Um, so even when I go back now, I rarely interact <laughs> with the rest of the community. So there are a couple of families that I will visit, um, and the rest of it is just my family. That's the the only place that I will be at uh, when I go back. Right, right. That is very interesting. Um, not saying that there is anything wrong, but then I was reading an article by Dr. Rob Henderson who mm -hmm. talks about who coined the term luxury belief, which is a very a term that I really, really find applicable across my life. Mm -hmm. And then one of his newsletters is titled Rich Friend, Poor Friend, where he talked about how he tried to share his experience of being educated and then leading a more comfortable life with his friends who came from a similar background from himself, which is very poor and uh, laden with poverty. And they were not necessarily very receptive. I'm not sure if you've had experience like that before. Ah, uh, uh, with the similar age group, I don't think I I even tried. So, oh. uh, <laughs> but I do engage with younger people today. Um, so people from uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged background or any marginalized communities for that matter, um, and that I. I would like to do, and I would like to do more of that uh, as I move forward. Um, that yes, um, usually they they are quite receptive. At least the ones that I had an opportunity to interact with, they they see the value. Um, but probably it's due to the settings as well. Um, so I usually interact with these um, kids, teens. Um, in formalized settings. So there might have been an organization that invited me. So I would assume that kids who turn up to those events already have certain level of motivation wow. um, and, and they, they see the value. Um, I'm not sure 
outside that context, maybe they will be less receptive. Um, again, it, it depends on what we are communicating as well. Um, it, I, I will usually go with where they are at. Right, some um, may rightfully think that they want to stay within village because there is a life there, um, and one that it, if that's the one that they aspire uh, to be in, then I think that's entirely fair. Um, but of course, we want to escape poverty, violence. I think those things need to be um, removed. But if everything is comfortable for them, I think it's entirely fair for them to stay uh, where they are. But anytime I, I witness a person um, who want to get out, I, I, I will do anything within my power to assist them. So I think I was assisted, certainly. Um, right, right. You mentioned the theme poverty many times. I was wondering if you've read the book by Jorn Lombard on, I can't remember, how to make the world a better place with $75 billion, something like that. No, I haven't had the opportunity. To I have not that as well, but then I have mm -hmm. listened to his podcast episodes and his speech in the ARC, uh, Alliance of Responsible Citizens, uh, something like that uh -huh. in one of the it, it's I believe a, a platform for the classical liberals now conservative people to mm -hmm. share their thoughts. and he's an economist who if I remember correctly he he sets out to study the priorities that the world should have mm -hmm. that the world should have and should aim to solve to make the world a better place and I believe one of the top factors would be poverty as opposed to something like climate change, <laughs> which is mm -hmm. very interesting. So no, I just thought that you, you might have read him since I'm sure you will like him a lot. So mm -hmm. you should explore that. Yeah. Since not, um, I wanted to ask you about the kids that you have met and by kids, I mean, teenagers and university students as well. So you now teach in a private university in the city. Um, which would mean that you meet a lot of students from different walks of life. There would be ones who are socioeconomically very privileged, and then there would be people from the, a background that is more similar to yours. Now, stating generalizations, do you see mm -hmm. any differences among these students who come from these different backgrounds in general? Um, I think if I look at just the institution that I'm uh, working actively uh, in at the moment, I, uh, there are not a whole lot of variations uh, simply because the quite a large proportion of students who come to my current institution are privileged. Um, right. So they, they are fairly okay uh, in regards to financial stability. Uh, they're also coming from uh, families where the parents may have had college education already. Um, so I think in, in that regard, they, they have plenty of resources to help them succeed. Uh, there is a um, minor proportion who might be coming from a less privileged um, positions. Um, but in those instances, they are typically motivated. I think if a less privileged, uh, someone from a less privileged position come makes it to university, they will be motivated uh, to do well. Um, again, this might be a generalization, but I would assume the vast majority um, of the students will be of that nature. Um, but I have I had opportunity to interact um, with students from other institutions and also talking to educators, other institutions. I've worked with, uh, in other institutions before as well, where there are a lot more variation uh, in regards to students' background. Uh, and usually, um, again, this is a generalization, uh, but I, I do see a difference. So people who are from um, social economically disadvantaged background, I, I, I see them putting in um, their best effort. Um, and I, I think they, they see the value in that. Um, but less privil uh, more privileged, not necessarily that they are not uh, doing their best. Um, fair number of them are, um, but there might be a, a bigger proportion of individuals um, who are coming from a privileged position that they don't necessarily need to put in a whole lot of uh, effort because 
there is a fallback. The parents will have their back, or um, that there will be other uh, support systems uh, would be able to uh, hold their weight even if they fail. Um, but someone who has very less uh, to start with, that's that's the only uh, avenue to improve their quality of life. I think I, I see more of them. Obviously, there are exceptions uh, to this where they might be coming from a less privileged uh, background, but they're still not putting in the best effort. Usually that's because uh, there's a mismatch between what they want to do uh, and what a traditional university can offer. Um, so they, they may not be as inclined to go through this traditional formal university education. Uh, their interest might be in technical, vocational, which in my view are equally valuable. Um, so they're just at the wrong place. I think as soon as they find the right place, the right education institution, they will excel too. Right, 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 right. That is very interesting. Um, personally, I've observed that people who are privileged, put it this way, I don't think I've met very many motivated people. I don't think I've met very many privileged people who are very motivated, at least when mm -hmm. I was <laughs> and your observation as well. Yeah. Do you typically try to motivate them as their teacher or lecturer or professor? I will encourage them, um, but I won't go full on motivating um, the demography that I'm handling at the moment. Uh, because my view is if you come to university, then you should be self motivated. Right. Uh, because that should have been a choice. Um, and there, there are alternative pathways after getting um, formal education for the last 11, 15, uh, 12 years, right? Um, so I, I, I don't agree uh, with this notion that I, I need to be going in there, motivating them uh, mm -hmm. to study in the first place. Because if you are not interested in studying at a university, then my question is, why are you here? Right. Uh, you could be excelling in alternative pathways, right? Uh, but I would encourage uh, students to do better. Um, so, so let's say um, they they are at a certain level, say they are currently at C level. I would certainly push them uh, towards a higher level. I, I usually will start off by saying we are all are going to achieve an A. That's our target. I will adjust uh, based on where the students actually want to be at uh, and their capacity, um, but th that, that's the extent that I will go to. If they're not interested in the subject matter, um, then, I'm, then I, I would be thinking about how else they can excel as opposed to motivating them uh, in that line itself, because that I don't think it's fruitful in my view. Right, right, right. Yeah. Motivation aside, though, if we talk about helping a student, recently I've been more interested in the field of intelligence, and I was really surprised when I found out that intelligence cannot really be improved. On the contrary, it can easily deteriorate if we don't try to maintain through exercise and leading a more healthy lifestyle. So as an educator, when you encounter students whose IQ is not necessarily very high, evidenced in perhaps their inability to learn more quickly or as quickly as their peers, how do you usually go about um, resolving that issue? And of course, it can be frustrated, not only on your end, but on the student's end as well. He or she probably realizes that um, she or he is not very bright. How would you come, come about that? Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I do agree that intelligence is pretty stable across life, right? Um, but of course, we, we have this notion of range uh, of reaction where there will be a bracket, right? Um, and depending on the environment, they may reach the uh, higher end of the bracket rather than the lower end, right? So I, I like to believe that um, with more nurturing and effort, they can push it a little, right? Not a whole lot, because I, I, I would like to acknowledge that intelligence uh, can be a biological limitation which cannot be overcome 
in the current world. We might be able to modify it in the future, but not in the current world, right? Um, but so intelligence is yeah. stable because of the way that it's calculated, right? Because I believe yes, that's what I was. Yeah, 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 which is why mathematically it's not possible to to increase it a whole bunch, if any at all. Yes, uh, that's exactly what I, I was uh, going to go next. University um, assessments um, and, and learning may not rely on um, how intelligence is measured. Right. right, right so right. our um, uh, IQ, um, I, I do think the current measure of uh, intelligence and using um, I, I, IQ as the unit um, is the best that we have compared to um, historical trends, right? Yes. It's it's the most reliable, most valid that we have. Um, however, um, while intelligence is related to, in my view, all aspects of human lives, uh, what is being measured at a university course, or at least in my uh, assessments, uh, may not depend on just the general intelligence. Um, so it would, would tap into other um, areas uh, and other avenues of the, the person's life where they would still be able to show improvement and do better uh, with effort. Right. Um, so it's something that they, they can work on. But that said, I have unfortunately seen instances where the student tries really hard, but they just cannot grasp. Uh, a particular idea. Um, maybe at that moment only, uh, some students do take a longer time to get certain things. Um, they might be able to capture that later on, which is entirely okay. But of course, uh, the, the problem with our current system is that it's time sensitive. You have yeah. four months to master this. If you don't, then your grades won't necessarily reflect your full capacity. It's just unfortunate reality. Um, but in many instances, I have certainly seen students progressing and doing better uh, with effort, right? Um, so it may not necessarily be the case that their intelligence has improved, but more about they are now better using their intelligence to do better, right? Because of the nature of the assessment. I, think, I, I do think it has to do with the measurement um, of their performance rather than um, whether the intelligence itself is taking a huge uh, peak. Right, right, right. And, and you have been teaching for how many years now? 10 years, eight years? Yeah, 10, 10 years plus. 10 years, right. So do you see a change? I think, do you see a cohort effect <laughs> that mm -hmm. a change has been evident throughout the years? Yeah, I'm just going to sound like uh, any other educator now. Uh, unfortunately, I do. Um, there, and I'm not sure if it's just, it could be because I've changed um, the, the nature of my uh, role and my responsibilities as well as institution. Right? So that could have played a, a role. But generally, um, I, I see that more and more students are less motivated um, in academic setting, right? Uh, there could be a number of reasons. Um, one of them um, is that they, they don't really want to be there, right? Uh, right. They don't have an uh, internal drive to explore uh, and learn more, go deeper, uh, et cetera, um, which was the traditional motive of a university. Right? Of course, university today is more than that. Um, in many instances, it's a stepping stone for them to launch their career. Right? If yeah. they, they want to go to the traditional route. Um, so that, that could be it. Um, but because of that absence of internal drive, um, many may be just happy with average performance as long as I pass. That's good enough, right? Um, that wasn't the case, I think, uh, or at least the proportion was not as big when I first started. Uh, oh, I thought yeah. I, I noticed a lot more students uh, had internal drive, right? Now, lesser so. 
Um, and the other thing is I've got the sensitivity of the uh, students, right? So they, they they seem to be less resilient um, than the previous generation. Partly it's that the world that they are growing up uh, in, um, but I, I have the, um, this responsibility of protecting them a little more, uh, being a little more tactful, uh, simply because they don't have the capacity yet. As much as I don't want to be the, sorry, okay. Addressing them by their right pronouns. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there are certain things that I can identify with, right? I understand. Um, but certain things are just taken overboard. Um, and as an educator, uh, I, I need to make sure that I, I don't fail them. So that, that that's my only uh, concern. So sometimes I, I do want to show tough love, um, but I, I want to build a relationship, uh, get their trust. After that, I'll, I'll try to educate them a little more uh, than just the academic matters. Right? So sometimes they, they're just not having a realistic view of the world, right? Um, and that, that's because that's the environment that they grew up in. I, I won't blame them entirely um, because a lot of the times I see that as the fault of the parents or guardians rather than them, right? So when you overprotect a child, that's exactly how they will turn up, right? right? Um, so I can't entirely crush them. Um, so I, I try to build a relationship and then I, I still want them to build little more resilience um, by the time they graduate. Right, right. So so yeah. like, it's like you're making reference to the evil mother right, by Freud. The Sorry? Evil, the yeah. evil mother who feeds the child. So, yes. okay, I, I cannot really visualize what you mean by not having a realistic view of the world as a student. Do you mind to share an example, just a general one? Or multiple examples, <laughs> I'm open to that. Yeah, um, I think one, this was particularly after um us going through COVID-19 pandemic, right? So oh, is it. yeah, uh, it was there prior to it, um, but the, the proportion is just gigantic uh today, right? Um and this is just one of the examples. So, so um the the necess the idea that you can have as many extensions as you want. Uh, you you can have uh, as many um, leeways as you want, uh, simply because that's what we would expect. And we, we learned some of this during COVID-19 pandemic, right? Obviously, it was a tough time uh, and people were more tolerant um, and understanding um, at that time. And leeways um, and extensions were more common simply because we understood people were going through other things. Uh, and academia might not be their priority. They need to keep themselves. Um, yeah. Extension, do you mean? extension for the assignments and so forth. Yeah, okay. deadlines. Yeah. Um, so and at that time, it was understandable, right? Because they need to take care of themselves, their loved ones. That was their priority compared to academic pursuits. But it's no longer the same. Uh, but that notion has been carried away. Um, and it, I think it's gone overboard. So you, you see students uh, sending requests for extension um, without a hope, any valid reason. And when you turn it down, then you are the uh, evil person, right? Um, usually, if I have a rationale, I'm going to stand my ground. So I, I, I won't just um, give you the extension if you don't have a valid reason, right? Um, of course, there are other educators who have different views. That's entirely fair, um, but that, that's my stance, right? Because the world outside may not necessarily give you perpetual extension uh, to deadlines, right? So sometimes it's understandable, but there cannot be a habit. And we, I, I see a whole lot of um, that today. Yeah, that is the most immediate example that comes to mind. Right, right. That actually yeah. reminds me of a... Uh of a professor, I can't remember which university he teaches in now, uh, Jonathan Haidt, he talked about ah. the calling of the American mind. And 
this is something that I've thought about for a long while, even when I was at UBC, the infantilization of university students. And I can share my observation as well. Um, and it will touch on another theme that I wanted to ask you, which is res respect for elderlies, which I think is a value that has not been very recognized in today's society because I grew up in a very traditional Chinese family. I have to show a lot of respect to the elderly. I have to address them by more respectful names. And then when I was at UBC, firstly, I see that, yes, people don't really have a realistic view of the world. And my example of that would be, I would be volunteering in a, in a research clinical lab, like yourself in a lab. And for people who have not volunteered in a lab before, a lab is kind of like a corporate office. There is a bureaucracy and a hierarchy. So you'll have the principal investigator under whom there are sometimes some professors and then under them, there are PhD students and then master students and then undergraduate students who were paid. And then there would be us, <laughs> a volunteer <laughs> who, are, who are, for lack of a better term, on the lowest rung of the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And then when we would have the opportunity to meet the principal investigator, I would like to think that we are, we should show a lot of respect because it's kind of like an intern meeting a CEO in a company. Mm -hmm. But I've observed in certain labs that some students don't necessarily show their respect. So they would speak with the principal investigator as if they were their equal. And mm -hmm. I, I had qualms with that. I, I was really skeptical. I was like, wow, is that the way that you should be speaking with an elderly, especially who is in that setting, your boss. So, so that is something that, that is interesting that I've observed, um, not having a realistic view of the world, thinking that that type of behavior should be accepted and, and should not be reprimanded because if we reprimand that, then we are the ones who are the evil person in your words. Right? So. And another instance of, I think, not having a realistic view and again, infantilization of university students would be extension, but not in the definition that you were using. I was thinking in terms of extending their undergraduate degree. Uh -huh. mm, I'm not sure if this is very common in Malaysia. I didn't go to university in Malaysia, have not been in a university setting in Malaysia, but in Canada, I do see a lot of people extend their degrees by five, uh, from four years to eight years to nine years for no valid reason. And mm. they feel that we are not supposed to, how should I put it? They feel that they don't deserve to be judged. And I'm not saying that people deserve to be judged, but I think there are actions that you can do that you should expect to be judged by. Mm. For example, having tattoos. You know, I have no issue with people having tattoos, but it's kind of like, if you're going to have tattoos, then you should prepare to be judged because that's how society works. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and, and, you know, the views might change as times elapse because of, you know, genera generational differences. And of course, you know, culture plays a role, but if we're speaking generally, then I think all these constitute having a realistic view of the world. Would you agree with the type of examples and my train of thought? Yeah, I, I think if they are um, doing certain things, that doesn't matter uh, what the action is, um, without having respect for social structures um, and valid expectations in the social world, um, then they're going to get reactions, right? I'm, I'm not sure if um, we can validate all judgments, right? Because people right. can certainly argue that it's not our place to judge another person, right? But that aside, if you are doing certain things that are in direct opposition to social structures, uh, social expectations, which are valid, and and of course, we know we, we want to challenge social structures for the progress, um, that that's uh, understandable. But a lot of the times we want to um, also respect existing social structures because that's essential for harmony, right? Uh, and not creating constant chaos, uh, which is happening in certain university campuses today, right? Um, so I, I think if that's what at play, 
then I think it's, it's fair to expect uh, a reaction. Um, so this is, uh, I was talking about extension of uh, deadlines uh, earlier. There are also other uh, things that I've noticed. So some say in a, in a university setting, um, you get to choose your classes for the most part. Um, right. So technically you can design your timetable in a way that you uh, can cope with, right? But I've heard students uh, complaining that they don't have a specific lunch time, right? Uh, they don't have time to uh, get lunch in between classes, right? Uh, and that is coming from, again, it is a parenting problem in my view, because uh, earlier you didn't get give any opportunity to, uh, to these kids to be independent, right? You prepared all their meals, and they didn't have to think about it at all. So they expect the same thing at university that the instructors, the support staff are supposed to be thinking about the uh, meal time, right? Um, and that's something that you would expect the student to be thinking of at that time. And uh, unfortunately, I've heard stories from employers where uh, the students go on internship and they expect their supervisors to be thinking about their lunchtime, right? So they they say, okay, we have a meeting uh, a, in the next hour, and then they say, I, I haven't had lunch yet, right? Uh, and this is a meeting time that has been communicated before, right? So it may sound extreme, and when I first heard it, it was extreme, but I'm hearing similar stories where like basic things, they which can entirely be avoided if you just plan your life a little. Um, are present, right? So that is obviously not how the world work outside university setting, outside um, your home bubble, right? Um, but that's what we are dealing with uh, at the moment. Again, there are obviously students who are well adjusted. Uh, and I think, I think more than half are doing just okay. Um, but that is a good proportion who are in this group. Uh, how dare you, Selvan? How dare yeah. you their lives? This is yeah. being very compassionate to them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but I was thinking, um, if I'm dealing with them directly, I I'll tell them um, that they need to plan. And I have very strict rules in regards to my class start time, uh, etc. Um, but then, Part of me, like if they are not learning here, when they go out, the world is going to teach them the lesson. Um, because they, they can't expect this. Like outside. So, okay, well, you met, since you mentioned, right? Um, well, before we move on to that, I actually want to ask one last question about um, how students have changed over the years. So, if you were to do a fun longitudinal observational experiment right now, so you would, so you mentioned that students perhaps five or six years back, I'm saying five because you taught me five years ago. We know mm -hmm. it's seven years, seven years ago. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wait, seven years ago. Okay, well, if you look back at students seven years ago, who, because you mentioned that the pattern seems to be that students in the past, they had more motivation, more drive, and had a bit more of a sense of direction. And if you look at them now, they would have been adults, right? Do they still have that type of drive and sense of direction? you think from, I don't know, observing from the outside or from social media, as opposed to students right now that you meet a bit later? I think so for the most part. So we, we are talking about students that I've met like seven years ago, how are they doing today? Is that what yeah. you're looking at? Yeah, because uh, the argument or the generalization that we made was that students in the past, that you have met in the past, they are a bit more driven compared to mm -hmm. students Mm -hmm. so if you were to make an a longitudinal observational experiment oh, to back up mm -hmm. your argument that yeah. the statement or the generalization is correct, uh, would 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 the result comm be con commensurate with your hypothesis? Let's mm -hmm. say. Okay, I, I don't have unfortunately I don't have the privilege of going. Uh, I mean, uh, being able to see where all the students turn up. But right. the the ones that I have the honor of witnessing, they obviously have reached places. Um, and now that you are you're pointing it out, and I'm thinking back, do I see lesser of that today? Because 
the students that are meeting uh, may not necessarily be as motivated. Uh, I'm not sure, but I have certainly seen many successful professionals um, that um, I have met eight, nine years ago. So there are some that I have I met when I first started uh, my career uh, as a tutor. Um, they are doing wonderful um, today. Um, I, I see lesser of that. It could be due to two reasons. One um, is I, I, I'm less active on social media today than I was a few years ago, so I maybe was able to stay in touch better and thus I was able to witness. So that's one. The other could be the, the very uh, pattern. Um, I think in general, I like to believe that we, we need certain drive um, in order to go places, in order to do uh, anything more than regular stuff, achieve extraordinary. Um, so that it's either going to come from some form of positive reinforcement, you gathered something that you really enjoy and you want more of that, so you go after it. Or like in my case, at least initial stages of my life where you are trying to avoid some form of discomfort or pain, right? Uh, when you have everything that you need in order to live a comfortable life, it's tempting to just stay where you are. Why would you go through the trouble uh, to go higher? Um, and for that matter, they may not achieve a whole lot of things, right? But that was obviously a counter argument to this. Um, just because we are striving to be better, to reach greater heights, does not necessarily mean that that's the best way to live because that comes with uh, their uh, own dangers. Right? Uh, maybe people who are not aiming high are more satisfied with their life than we are. Um, but um, th that's that's my observation thus far. Right, right. So in short, the students whom you have met in the past seem to be <laughs> reading greater, greater heights compared to the students that you meet more recently. Yeah, yeah. Even right. in, in terms of regards to sometimes, it just it hurts me as an educator uh, that even within a, a few semesters, I, I, I notice some um, assignments and their quality. They, they typically descend uh, as opposed to going on upward trend. Right? Uh, we would, I would expect them to go on upward trend because they have more samples to refer to. They have more um, resources to tap into and people to talk to, but they, I don't necessarily see it. Uh, there are obviously exceptions. My um, last semester was an exception where the students did do a lot better than a couple of previous cohorts. Um, but usually I, I see that um, the, even the quality of submissions are not fantastic. Um, than the ones that I used to have. Right, right. Well, that is a pretty grave reality that we have to deal with. <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't want to add a little bit more about what you mentioned that perhaps not, perhaps that there might be some who argue that not reaching your full potential by pushing yourself would be the better way. I completely disagree with that. As mm -hmm. someone who is a fan of Dostoevsky, the Russian literature, Russian author, he has mentioned that in his in his book uh, notes from underground he mentioned that if we have everything we want in life and we don't gain a sense of importance um we will try to destroy things just to prove to mm -hmm. ourselves we have a sense of importance and freud also echoes that idea of the sense of importance that we feel that is it is necessary for us to experience a sense of importance and if we don't direct that energy to something that is valuable personally, because something that is valuable, valuable personally, I like to think will translate to to the distal environment as well. Mm -hmm. Then we will direct that energy to something else. So it could be hedonistic temptations or like Hitler, he would direct it to a lot of chaos and and disasters just for the sake of it and to experience a little bit of a sense of importance, which is very mm -hmm. scary to think about. And I think people who don't don't think about that to that degree are ignorant of history and of our tendency to be evil because recently i've read um 
Rob Henderson's newsletter as well. On the, I think I sent it to you, uh, the tendency mm -hmm. to both be evil and be good. And given that we know we can be evil, we should yeah. be careful about how we direct our energy. And I've been teaching for a while as well. So I think you could tell since you got to know mm -hmm. me that I enjoy teaching. And the students that I teach right now are mostly teenagers. And I find them very different from myself. Well, I like to think that I'm an exception, but I think they are also different from the peers that I've met. So the level of the lack of motivation is superbly low compared mm -hmm. to the peers that I met that I thought were not very motivated. Yeah, so, so that is an interesting observation. And given that we teach, I'm sure, students from completely different backgrounds, but then we still arrive at the same observation, is something that is pretty not very not something that we would smile at yeah. um yeah and i wonder why as well and and okay back to the point about not being satisfied when you don't achieve uh your full potential right i think i kind of observe that in some adults so whether it be family or friends or family friends I see that adults who are not fulfilling their potential, they're engaging in activities that I would not like to engage in when I reach their age. So mm -hmm. it could be pornography, it could be um, drinking, uh, some sort of recreational activities that are not very good to their health. And I think that really reflects the ideas that when you don't have a sense of meaning, you devolve into these hedonistic temptations. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you observe that as well among people your age or older than you? Yeah, I think I'd like to think that you know, running back to a motivation, um, that, that is an area that I'm interested in, um, particularly academic motivation, but in general, um, and because I observe it quite a bit, um, I, I've looked into literature and I, I, I try to study it on my own as well. Uh, and there are many factors. One of them has to do with, you will be familiar with it, uh, psychological need satisfaction, right? So going back to the same idea that you referred to, like, so I think self-importance is one way of looking at it, but it also relates to competence, right? You should feel um, that you are good at something. Um, and we also have um, the the need for relatedness, right? So you you want to uh, feel affiliated, um, and you care for, you are able to care for, etc. So the, the social nature, um, as well as autonomy. So you should feel free. Yeah. Uh, again, it, it may sound like I'm not blaming our parents all the way, uh, but children, in my view, need to be taught. Um, that's that's one of the reasons I do not agree that a parent should be another friend. They don't need another friend in their life. They have enough friends. They need an adult, uh, a, a parent for that matter, right? Uh, so when they don't get opportunity to exercise their full freedom um, or liberty of choice uh, that's that's autonomy related uh, when they don't get opportunity to feel um, they can work towards something master it and then feel good about it as opposed to everyone gets a trophy everyone it's a winner which i do not agree with um, as well as the 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 opportunity to affiliate with other people right so you you get um um, care and love from other people, you also offer it to other individuals um, and you have meaningful social relationships, right? Um, so I, I see that people today, uh, especially teens, may not necessarily have these opportunities like the previous generation um, or the, the, the opportunities are misguided, uh, misplaced, um, and that could be causing the, the lower levels of motivation, uh, in, in my view, that that's my prediction. Needs to test a whole lot of premises here, um, that it makes sense to me, uh, theoretically. Um, so that when we look at academic motivation, for instance, one of the things that regularly cite um, is that they don't feel belong. Right. right. Uh, which makes sense. Like I, I think back uh, on my, my university uh, days, one of the things that I enjoy, even though it is out of my nature, is discussion. 
and debating ideas, uh, et cetera. Um, I, I don't necessarily see that uh, naturally happening in, in today's classroom, right? So I, I need to probe that. I need to facilitate that. Um, I, I would like to you eventually get students to that stage. But when you don't have it, you don't actually feel um, that you belong uh, and that that will obviously um, demotivate you. So I think similar instances are happening uh, elsewhere. Um, and thus people in general, particularly teens, are um, little demotivated. Uh, and if we touch on these factors, in addition to a whole range of other things that we need to pay attention to as well, I think we can get, get them there. Um, so while I do think that the motivation is lower, um, I'm not entirely uh, disheartened. So there's, there's no hope, right? Because I, I, I'm pretty sure that there are interventions that we can put in uh, yeah. to push it up. Yeah. Right, right. And if you were to be brave to posit some interventions, what, how would they look like? Yeah, uh, I, I think for me, uh, psychological needs satisfaction is, is a, a crucial factor um, because I, I like to um, believe that motivation comes from um, us satisfying some form of need because that, that gave the, the drive, right? Um, so I'll pay attention to these three elements. Um, there are certain things um, that I implement within the classroom, but I also uh, do this in a sneaky manner with people that I'm close to, um, uh, especially family members. Um, so first, autonomy. So autonomy can be experienced in multiple ways, but one of the easiest ways to do that is to simply by giving choices. Uh, even if it's a non-real choice, the fact that they see choices uh, is good enough, right? Um, I, I rarely give non-meaningful choices, um, but sometimes um, if I really want students to work on a particular topic, but if I force them to do it, they are not going to be as motivated. So I'll give an alternative topic. But then anyone who looks at it will know which topic to go for uh, because of the resources available for it, or the uh, relevancy, et cetera. But in general, I, I give options um, because when we have options, we are going to be more motivated right? because we, we chose it and we are going to be more committed. Uh, and then the competence is opportunity um, to achieve um success right so we feel like we are good at something people have different capacities obviously um but I, I think there are many things in life where if you put in the effort you can experience success um so we just need to give that opportunity uh to students uh, in, in my case but also uh, in other instances uh, and of course the last one has to do with meaningful social relationship um a lot of if we talk about an evolutionary sense, the relatedness aspect should be the easiest to tackle, but that seems to be the, the most challenging aspect today, simply because people are not necessarily having traditional face-to-face um, -face relationship, right? There is value in online relationship, but also there are drawbacks. Uh, and many people are sticking to just online uh, relationships, right? So when you don't have um, face-to-face -face relationships and interactions which have fair amount of emotions, disagreements, negotiations, etc., then you don't necessarily feel that you are part of a community, which is, I think, essential um, for motivation. So those, those will be the three things that I will perpetually try to target. Right, right. So autonomy, confidence, and a meaningful relationship. Yeah, that 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 coincides with what I believe in as well. I think we will be able to lead a harmonious life if we have the very basic needs in place. So it, it's, to me, it's things like you know having a career, relationship, uh, family, interests outside of your work, and uh, interests that will challenge you intellectually. And they 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 come in tandem with the three points that you have mentioned: autonomy, comp competence, and a meaningful relationship. And I like to touch on the importance of face-to-face -face interaction as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've heard Dr. Frank DeWald, the zoologist, 
mentioned the importance of that as well, that um, we might not realize it, but our olfactory senses, our sense of smell actually influences us as well when we are interacting with someone. And as someone whose job uh, involves a lot of selling and pitching to clients, I do see the difference as well. I think that people forget that you're human when you're speaking um, with them very often online, especially when you have not met them before. And interestingly, I find that clients are more susceptible to using offensive language <laughs> when they when they speak with me online as opposed to in person. In person, everyone's just more nice, mm-hmm. especially when the client is male. Uh, that, that, then that kind of that that made me more interested when I learned when I thought about it from a more evolutionary sense, because evolutionarily. Um, males, we are more physically aggressive, whereas female, more instrumentally aggressive, which means that in every male interaction, there is a risk that you would be beaten up. Generally <laughs> speaking, that could be why I think that guys, when you're speaking with each other, they are, at least when I speak with my male clients, they tend to be more nice with me when I speak with them in person. And mm. it could be interviews as well. And then, of course, considering if I'm able to put up a disagreeable front when I have to. And, and the lack of face-to-face interaction, I think, has, has led to a lot of social awkwardness. So I've mm-hmm. met teenage students who don't even know how to approach a girl that, that they're interested in, which I don't know. I, I think um, when I was at their age, I had that type of issues. And my peers would have that type of issues, but then we didn't really have a choice, right? So we would have to <laughs> speak mm-hmm. with people that we're interested in, even though we had smartphones at that time. But then I also think that the scam I mean pandemic, <laughs> made a difference in how we how we perceive the world and social interactions in general. Mm. I find that I I have not been as punctual <laughs> as I would like since the since mm-hmm. the lockdown. <laughs> because I know that I have the choice to meet people online. Yeah. But anyhow, um, coming back to your point, yeah, I do think these three points are very important, autonomy, competence, and a meaningful relationship. And it also sounds like you would believe that, uh, considering that you have a psychology background, of course, that focusing on the individual um, from the get-go would be more impactful than focusing on some sort of grand scale societal changes if we were to motivate students at least. Yeah, um, I, I do see the value of focusing on them concurrently, right? right? But in terms of immediate impact and immediate change, it's easier to work on the individual than societal structures. Um, it, it's I, I won't agree that the status quo is okay, uh, right. but it's gonna take time. Right. So as there are people who are working to improve that, let them do their work. But we can't wait until then uh, in order to take the individual step. That can be taken now. uh, And we need to acknowledge if there are limitations in the world in the way that it's currently structured, then that's a limitation that we need to overcome. Right. That cannot be uh, the ultimate excuse that we don't even try. Um, So I I, I do want to be uh, cautious there um, because despite coming from a uh, disadvantaged background, I do have certain privileges. Uh, First of all, I had the privilege of having excellent teachers throughout my educational journey. Not many uh, may have had that, right? So that similarly, there are other privileges. um, So that needs to be acknowledged, but um, there are certainly things that we can do at the individual level, regardless of our circumstances. I have right. seen um, individuals who are from extreme circumstances. Recently, I've been working with um, refugee teens uh, who escape war-torn areas. Um, and when I, when I look at their lives um, and their emotional state, uh, it is so painful to even witness it, right? More so for them to carry that burden. But even in those painful um, instances, they are trying their level best to get out of it um, and find a life um, 
hopefully they will be able to return uh, to their home country. If that's what they desire uh, later. But at least at the current moment, uh, where most parts of the world are not receptive uh, towards refugee teams, right? Uh, but they, they are trying their level best despite all this limitation. This is one example where despite your circumstances, you can try to overcome it, right? Uh, while again, acknowledging our privileges and certain horrendous social situations. Right, right. I completely agree with that, Salvin. That, that is so <laughs> important because I think regardless of the background that you're in, um, um, people might say, oh, you know, you're a privilege, so you don't deserve to say that. And I don't believe in that. I think people should be able to say what they want to say, despite uh, uh, regardless of their background whatsoever. So uh, I want to share another example as well um, about how regardless of how our environment is, we can do our best to achieve what we can. Um, of course, my example wouldn't be as extreme as the one that you just provided, because I think that is like <laughs> at the end of the spectrum. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, my example would be more, more onto my education. So I come from a Chinese speaking, Mandarin speaking background and nobody in the family spoke English with me. And I didn't, didn't have a lot of English exposure when I was young. So when I was 13, I transferred to an international school. Then I, my grade was really bad and then I couldn't really speak and write fluent English. So I was like, okay, I'm going to read every day so that I will improve my English. And then I was thinking, okay, not a lot of people could speak English with me at home. So I will read out loud. And that really helped me a lot. And maybe I was a little bit gifted in, as far as language proficiency, I was able to pick it up quite quickly. But I do see students nowadays, coming back to students today, right, who would tell me that, oh, I don't have people to speak English with. I I don't have English books to read. And I'm kind of like, you have Google. I, I didn't have Google. <laughs> well, there was Google, but then it was not as popular as now. But then I would find ways to read. And then uh, students would tell me that looking up the definition of words is troublesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was like, what? You have Google because <laughs> I'm not that old. But then when I was <laughs> a teenager, I had to carry a dictionary and then I had to look up the the definition of words in a thick dictionary. So I was like, what? Uh, so so I'm going kind of going off topic. But yeah, regardless of our environment, we can still do our best. I I don't believe that our environment can stop us more than we believe. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we have a lot of potential. and it's really kind of like putting your hand in every cookie jar so mm. that you can do your best. And maybe that is why uh, I, I enjoy jobs that are sales oriented because that's kind of what we have to do as a salesperson, right? We have mm -hmm. to kind of find every way to, to, to find a lead and then make the relationship warm and so forth rather than complain that, oh, all the leads are cold, for example. But uh, regardless of whether or not someone is in sales, the utility of of recognizing your own personal autonomy, like you mentioned, is is so important yeah. in succeeding in any field. I have a question, Selvin. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that students nowadays are getting more sensitive. Mm -hmm. Can you share with me a little bit more about that? Um, okay, there, there are different dimensions to this, um, some of which may not have necessarily reached Malaysian land. Um, but in general, <laughs> uh, I think I think I can guess what you're going to say. Yeah. But then, I'm not sure how but, much you follow Rob Henderson. I follow him quite a bit. I watch a lot of his podcast episodes hmm. and his girlfriend is actually Malaysian. Oh, okay. yeah. So, so he, and you know what's so funny? His girlfriend's hometown, I believe, is in the same area as where my brother-in-law is from, and mm. my brother-in-law. Uh, so my my business partner's husband, my business uh -huh. partner, you know, <laughs> okay. RCM. Yeah. So so there was one time when he posted on Instagram that he was in Malaysia. I was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly where he lives. And then in his podcast episode, he he mentioned that. 
he feels that Malaysians are not as sensitive as people in the West because we have real problems to deal with. And I think that is true. <laughs> because, you know, recently uh, in Chinese New Year, I don't care what people say, I'm going to call it Chinese New Year. I see people at UBC um, talking about, oh, we're not like Chinese New Year, it's supposed to be Lunar New Year. I'm kind of like, I can call it what I want. Okay. And I don't think that makes me racist because in Malaysia, we all call it Chinese New Year. That doesn't make me culturally insensitive. If I'm going to Vietnam and people call it Lunar, New, Lunar New Year, then I'm going to say Happy Lunar New Year. But if I come from a place where we call it Chinese New Year, I'm not going to change just because I want to be culturally sensitive and compassionate and all that rubbish. So mm -hmm. yeah, we have real problems to worry about. So I think a lot of the... Uh, extreme lefting ideologies have not arrived in Malaysia and we should make sure that they never will. <laughs> Let's see. I, I, uh, I mean, any any form of extreme, either extreme, I'm not okay with. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, but then coming back to the sensitivity, it's about um, the, the, the way students um, react uh, to certain things. Um, I'm typically quite careful um, with the way that I interact, um, not, not because I, I don't want to um, make people sensitive, etc., but in just being respectful, I think. Uh, I would like to keep all communications respectful. But I have heard uh, from colleagues where they may have said something or um, they made a gesture and that is misinterpreted and overblown, right? So there could be a single word that they have mentioned uh, and that that is taken um, to an extreme level, right? Um, so it doesn't matter what the word is, but, it, but then it, making it extreme is the problem. Right. Uh, even when, let's say, the, the the person is clarifying that they didn't have ill intention, or um, that they didn't mean it, um, and then even after that, the person saying, "Okay, maybe I was not careful. I apologize." Right. Um, but some some people may go on and on uh, about that. Um, I think that that is a little extreme. Um, and right. it's partly because of the way that we have nurtured uh, these teens that, okay, you, you speak your mind um, and you stand up for yourself. Yes, you should stand up for yourself, but be reasonable uh, yeah. and understand uh, where people are coming from uh, and the fact that the world doesn't revolve around you. Right. So every single thing is not about you. It's not about people trying to make you upset. Most people have better things to do. Right. Um, yeah, oh, that is absolutely true. Yeah, I think. Um, when I was at UBC, this sort of became more prominent because of the George Floyd issue. And yes, you know, they are, I guess they're there, there are structural problems in the world. But I think for the most part, we have to acknowledge that we have made a lot of progress and we have come a long ways from before. And for example, the, the rates of absolute poverty has increased. Um, I think, I think I would say uh, even without having read any data that the rates of inequality have decreased generally. Um, but I think the George Floyd issue gave a lot of activists, a lot of narcissistic a activists, a lot of reasons to quote unquote stand up for themselves and, mm -hmm. and, and react in a way that is unreasonable uh, because their feelings have been hurt, for example. And I've seen that in, in psych lectures as well when I was at UBC, so I would be very surprised. And like I mentioned, people would would stand up for themselves and speak to professors as if they were they're equal. Um, and they would give professors very bad ratings just because professors refute them in a lecture, which is, I don't think, very reasonable. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I think that, that that would capture what I mean by sensitive, whether they are being reasonable uh, or not. I, I do think speaking up for yourself and speaking up against um, injustices is needed. Uh, and if anyone is going to change that, it, it will be the, the current youth and the younger generation. Um, but we also need to stay reasonable. Yeah, going to either extreme is it's not going to benefit anybody in my view. Right, right. Yeah. But honestly, I'm not sure if I'm extreme in, in adopting this stance. If I were to be an educator, I would even go so far as to tell young people not to be activists because I don't think they know enough the world to be an activist. It would mm -hmm. be very one-sided and emotionally driven. And I say that because I feel that I, I tried to be an activist when earlier on in my university career, my mind was polluted, <laughs> I think, by the extreme left-wing teachings. Um, and interestingly as well, something that I've, I've uh, learned from online lectures is that I think one of the factors that predicts uh, support for political correctness is having taken a course that focuses on political correctness. And when I yeah. went to UBC, I took two courses which focused on political correctness. And at that time, my mind was too malleable and <laughs> not very intelligent yet, I guess. So I bought into a lot of those ideas. And then when I took uh, sociology courses in my second year, I was acting a bit like an activist. And then in a while, I found out how how ridiculous I was acting and behaving. So, and I, I would like to think that a lot of young people are very prone to that because a lot of my peers were like that. So mm -hmm. I would say that young people should not even be activists because they, like you mentioned, they should take care of them, themselves first. Their most immediate type of, um, well, responsibilities in their vicinity that they can take care of because they don't know what the world holds. They don't know how complex things can be. And, mm -hmm. and but that's why you mentioned that structural changes take time, right? That yeah, because they are complex. That's why they take time. And I think young people cannot appreciate that. I, I don't think I don't even think that people in their mm -hmm. late twenties can be an, a qualified activist. Maybe in their forties or fifties, but maybe not in their twenties and thirties. Mm -hmm. As in to make activism a large part of their lives. I mean, that's yeah. probably not commercially viable and not super beneficial to themselves and to society. Hmm. I, I, I see your point, Ken. Uh, but as an educator, um, um, I, I would say the activism itself is not the problem. It's how it's handled by the people around and adults around. Um, idealism is one of the features of that growing mind, right? So an adolescent will be idealistic, right? That's that's why they have constant struggle with um, their parents, their guardians, their uh, teachers at times, right? Uh, because they can now finally, because of brain development, can envision a hypothetical world, an ideal world, an right. utopian world. Uh, and they see the reality, which is nowhere near that. Uh, and then they say that they can make it better, right? Everyone yeah. is wrong except for themselves. So that that is, I, I think, in my view, uh, that is part of that growing process, right? So it's it's okay for them to feel it, but I don't think it's okay for adults in the world to react to them as if... Um, that is the ultimate truth. Right, right. Because most people, as you have experienced, will grow out of these um, unrealistic expectations of the world. Right, right. right? Uh, I, I think they, they will learn it as they go along. I, I do think um, that the society uh, and the structural things need to be changed, right? And the young people are going to uh, drive that. There's no uh, problem with it. Um, but it's more about acknowledging what they are going through. I think it becomes a problem when adults behave like teenagers, right? So if 
teenagers want to this idealistic world, let them discuss, let them, um, you know, if they want to march peacefully, let them do it. That is part of a free society. Uh, they will eventually see uh, their reality. Um, and I, I don't necessarily want to stop that because that's, I think, that's part of the growing process. Um, right. But when adults join that and they behave as if that we can change the world the next day, that becomes a problem because right. the other adults are the ones fueling this. And a lot of times it's for their own benefit and that has caused um, bigger problems. I think in certain parts of the world, the reason why certain um, marches, etc., are so big is because adults are dipping in, right? Um, and they shouldn't be doing it, right? Um, but if they are having heated discussion in a classroom, I don't see a problem in it. As an educator, I want those discussions to happen. Let them grow, let them debate. Um, and they entertain the idea and then they can form their opinion, right? They yeah. Even when they realize that, oh, I was wrong, entirely okay, that's a growing process. And we do know that over time, people will become more moderate they will get mellowed and teenage years is the fiery uh, years of life. Right. Yeah. That messianic tendency, right? Yeah. 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 Right, right. Mm. Mm. Yeah, okay. That's just me. Like for, for, for kids, I feel like you shouldn't take play away from kids. Let them play, let them make mistakes, let them fall down. Similarly, teenagers, let them idealize, uh, let them voice out when they they behave certain way towards adults. That's understandable. It's the adult who should behave uh, appropriately back because their brain has matured. They have no excuse to behave like a teenager. Teenager's brain is not fully developed yet, right? Uh, so we know that. But you know, I'm not negating their capacity. Teenagers today are, um, they, they have, greater resources, they, they can reach their maximum capacity, definitely. Um, and in my view, again, as I said, they are not there because of the uh, the environment. Um, but they they shouldn't be taken away uh, from right. that, I feel. Yeah. Right. That is right, though. Uh, I do agree with you that we, we shouldn't mm -hmm. stay away from them. Um, so yeah, good point for me. I shouldn't stop a kid from being an activist. <laughs> let them grow. Let, let them grow. They will find their space. Right, the right. Yeah. I do want to ask, because just now you mentioned that, um, okay, you know, if the kids are going to have unrealistic views, this is different from them uh, being sensitive. This is more of them having, un well, well, I guess they come hand in hand, right? That. Uh, they have unrealistic views and they they are too idealistic and so forth. And we say that the world will teach them. But I do have a question though, because I used to think the same that, oh, probably the world will teach them in one way or another. And then when I was at university, uh, we would enter a lecture and expect to have some degree of independence and responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so when I entered the workforce, I expected the same. Yeah. But I've met people, let's say, let's put it this way. I've met friends who are, who are human resource managers, HR managers, HR learning managers. And who have told me that part of their job is to motivate their employees to upskill themselves because these employees are substandard and are underperforming. And I've written a newsletter on this pretty extensively that this is very much a regression as far as growth is concerned. So it seems like the world is not teaching them <laughs> to grow up. Uh. So. What do you think of that? I, I, I don't even know mm -hmm. how I should approach that question. I'm not sure if I should ask you if you see that around amongst people your age or what you think about that, or if you see that this is an issue that will perpetuate mm -hmm. and so forth. Because I was really shocked. 
because I was thinking, well, if the if the employee is underperforming, then the employee should should receive some sort of punishment, whether if it is in the form of a retrenchment or um I don't know, a pay cut or something because you're not doing their job well. And this is employee, and these are employees who are underperforming and are not motivated to learn. So it's not like they are doing their best and they're underperforming. That is a completely different story. This is, you have someone there uh, designated to motivate them to upskill themselves because they're unmotivated and they are not good at what they do. Mm. And this yeah. is in Malaysia, <laughs> not in mm -hmm. the West. Interesting. I'm thinking if there are such institutions, they will eventually fail. Um, because I'm, I'm thinking if I'll we do such a... Which institution it is when we finish the recording? <laughs> sure. Because uh, I'm, I'm thinking if we do things out of compassion um, and we acknowledge that not everyone started at the same level playing field, all of the worst is fair. I, I do think that effort needs to be continued. Um, whether you agree uh, with uh, with that or not, that that's for another day, right? Uh, but so again, the final point. No, whether so, that I, I I was saying that we everyone do not necessarily start on the same level playing field, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Um, so there are differences where they uh, began their journey. Um, but that aside. Um, I, I like to think that most institutions are not that reason, un, unreasonable, and even if they are, they're not going to sustain. Um, but in coming back to the world, uh, teaching them the lesson, I don't entirely leave it to the world. That is my probably the third option, right? Um, when I really don't see the students changing. Usually, I would have incorporated elements that they need to uh, pick up um, as a growing adult uh, as an emerging adult, um, as well as outside the university setting, right? Um, so I expect my students to be independent. There are, so point for one uh, example, I expect students to take care of certain sections um, of um, the materials on their own, right? So they need to understand on their own. It, it can be test, uh, tested. Uh, I I'll obviously will be there if they need guidance, but they will be expected to be independent, right? So this may be entirely a, a normal practice in certain parts of the world, but uh, in certain private institutions uh, in Malaysia, because it's seen as like any other business, your role as a lecturer is to give everything that their student needs, right? Um, I don't necessarily agree with that perspective because the student needs to be independent, right? Um, so other things that I was talking about, the, the meal uh, example, that's since I heard that multiple times uh, from employers, I, I make it a point that I, I, I see that they, they are planning their lives, uh, especially students that I have more um, interactions with my right? students that I'm directly advising, um, et cetera. So I, I do nudge them in those directions. If they don't change, I usually will give second nudge. After that, I'm thinking, okay, I have done my part. If you're not willing to change, then your learning uh, space will come later. And that's where I leave it to the world uh, to teach. And I usually I will communicate that to them as well. I'm going to give you a couple of opportunities, but if you're not taking up that opportunity, I'm not going to continuously do that because my pain, main responsibility is to uh, help you learn. And these are uh, other uh, pastoral stuff that I also need to take care of. Right, right. So I don't think, as at least in educational settings, um, we should just wash it away. Um, Educators need to play a role um, because one of the adults in their life should give them the opportunity to learn. If the parents have not done that, if the guardians have not done that, then their final kind of checkpoint before they go out and be a fully independent adult would be the tertiary education institution. So we need to play a role. Yeah, no, I do agree with that, that everyone starts from a different point whether it be from the perspective of intelligence or background and so forth, and people should get the support that they need, right? Everyone mm -hmm. should have an equal opportunity, um, but that equal opportunity will look different 
to everyone else. Mm. Well, of course, there will be debate as to what what is the what constitutes the opportunity and what constitutes the outcome. I don't think that everyone should have the same outcome. So, for example, I don't think that everyone should be going to Harvard, but I think that um, everyone should have the support that they need for them to apply to get mm -hmm. to Harvard. So definition is an issue here, right? Um, that's why people also argue about what equity and equality is. So given that equity is equality of outcome, I don't agree with equity. I agree with equality, everyone having the same type of opportunities, but that opportunity, that the equal opportunity does, does not look the same for everyone. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I would say that because um, I come from a non-English speaking background, so I probably would have needed much more support when I was 13 in an international school, as opposed to someone who comes from an English speaking background. That is to me an opportunity, but whether or not both of us are going to get the same grades, um, despite our varying levels of language proficiency is another story, right? Yeah. So, so that's that. Um, but, and then coming back to, to the institution failing, I do see that trend in many institutions very interestingly though. So as a citizen of the country, it worries me a little bit. Well, as a citizen, as a citizen of the world, actually, I wonder why that is because I don't know, maybe it's how my parents taught me that is not how the world works. If you mm -hmm. don't fight for what you need to, then you will be left behind. There is no coddling. So I guess I've not been very lucky that I'm not coddled by the superiors around me, whether it be in the family or at work. That is interesting. Okay, I have one final question for you before we end this episode, because we were on the topic about equality and equity. So when I was at UBC, um, in one of those politically correct courses, unfortunately, it was a psychology course. It was the abnormal psychology course. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you recommended that, that professor to me. Did not enjoy that course as well at all. Um, I did well in that course, but I didn't like the professor at all. I'll tell you who she is later. Um, we we're talking about uh, the standards of of. You're talking about how the standards of being a clinical psychologist is now very high, mm -hmm. and not a lot of people are able to reach those standards. Therefore, the standards should be lowered so that more people have the opportunity to become a clinical psychologist. Now, I completely agree, disagree with that. No, I completely mm -hmm. disagree with that. And I don't think it's it's difficult to give an example uh, to justify my rationale. It's kind of like if you had an emergency, a medical emergency today, and you know that there is a doctor in the hospital who received his qualifications because the standards have been lowered, would you want to be operated by that doctor? And mm -hmm. if you say yes, then how about your family member, All right? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to. I want the best doctor in the world to serve myself and my family members, especially my family members. So I completely disagree with the idea that standards should be dropped so that more people have the opportunities. And with that, uh, in Malaysia especially, I feel that Postgraduate qualifications have been given out like candy. Mm -hmm. Everyone can have a PhD. Um, I'm very young, but I, I think I'm going to hurt a lot of people's feelings. I have no respect at all for a lot of people who hold PhDs. In my view, and this can be pretty extreme, um, as far as psychology is concerned, at least, if you are unable to write a sentence, which is free of grammatical errors, you cannot be a psychologist because psychology is such a language focused field. Mm. I guess I can understand if they're from accounting, even though I'm not familiar, I'm not familiar with those fields, but I still think that in whichever field you're in, if postgraduate, postgraduate studies are concerned, language proficiency is kind of the prerequisite because you're doing research, you have to explore ideas and, and without language proficiency, you're unable to formulate and express complex ideas. 
Now, coming back to psychology, which is a field that I'm more familiar with, I see a lot of people online holding a doctorate uh, qualification, branding themselves as psychology, but they're not even able to communicate in plain and simple English. And I say English because that is the medium uh, through which we communicate. If today there is a PhD holder who cannot speak a single word of English, but they completed and wrote their thesis in Mandarin, for example, that's all fine. You know, <laughs> what I primarily focus on is language proficiency, not English language proficiency. But given that everyone that I know in my immediate um, network, social media network, uh, would have to communicate in English and would have completed their thesis in English, I think, yeah, you know, you should be able to write sentences free of grammatical errors. Otherwise, you cannot even communicate your idea, uh, let alone a complex idea. So what do you make of that as someone with a PhD? Mm. It's tricky. Um, I think it's before before we get here, um, we, we talked about lowering the standards. I, yeah. I also do not agree um, that we should lower the standards uh, if there are reasons for the standards, right? So if we we set certain standards um, because that's what we expected uh, to candidates to have um, in order to do well in that program. Right? So that there were reasons. Of course, there are other instances where we have lowered our standards right? uh, to entry uh, across different disciplines. A lot of the times it has to do with the language. Right? Um, so the English uh, language uh, standard has been lowered. Uh, and there is um, an acknowledgement of risk there. Right? So we, we lower standards because we want to make that program or anything uh, for that matter more accessible. Right? Uh, however, it is um, acknowledging that after being enrolled, you still need to buck up and do better in yeah. order to perform uh, at the same expected level. Right. So the ultimate standard should not be lowered, right? Just because the entry um, requirements have been lowered, right? Um, for PhDs or other uh, postgraduate uh, qualifications, um, it's the the entry requirements in many parts of the world um, is it's not that stringent. Um, it is not as, as strict, right? So it's pretty easy to get into the program, whether you graduate. That's a different story, right? So the dropout rate uh, for postgraduate uh, studies across the world is quite high, especially for PhD studies, right? Because it is a challenging study. Um, but if it is just given out without any regard for quality, obviously that that's so uh, meaningless. Um, and I think that there will come a time, not so far uh, into the future where people will start um, looking at the quality uh, of the PhD as well, uh, which institution it's uh, it's from um, and how it's regarded, right? Um, and then we are going to have a situation where there will be PhD holders who are well regarded. The rest, they will still be able to use their title because that's something that they have earned, but whether they will be given the same respect, I'm not sure. Because as it is, we have portals being created where we can check legitimacy of the doctorate degree, right? So some of the things will be in place, I think, uh, when we look at the institution which awarded it. Even in Malaysia, we know there are certain institutions that just give out um, more liberally, um, and it's we, we know that there's really no use to it, right? It's it undermines not only um, the the current cohort, but also the ones who worked hard and are really uh, capable of receiving that degree. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. Because if you were to be regarded as a doctor in a field, by definition, you are the cream of the crop. So I don't think, and and and. I've heard people argue against credentialism. I, I believe in 
meritocracy and credentialism. I think credentials are very important because given the limited time that we have in the world, we need to quickly identify competent people in the crowd. But then it is when the standards for those credentials are lowered and we are unable to, to distinguish the good ones from the bad and all of them have equal uh, status or qualifications, that is when the issue occurs. And that is when we see things like lack of quality and it's a pretty vicious cycle because uh, from people whom we expect quality, we don't see it. And then from, and it won't be good for the people who don't deserve those credentials as well, because that's when we have uh, a preponderance of unnecessary imposter syndrome mm -hmm. types, right? So, so yeah, I, I think that, well, I, I look forward to that day. I think mm -hmm. personally, I know of people which, whose PhD degrees I don't really have a lot of <laughs> respect for, for valid reasons. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, I like to think, but not, I like to think actually for, <laughs> for very valid reasons. Um, for example, like, I don't know, having a PhD in a where the thesis is on a personality model, which is not even scientifically valid. Mm -hmm. mm. That raises questions. And I think that is doing a disservice to society really, because then the, the holder can really spread any type of uh, false information that he or she would like. But yeah, um, I think we have come to the end of the podcast episode because We've been going on for almost two hours, the recording at least. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any final words for any students or anyone or any of my viewers? <laughs> Most of them are, are about my age, yeah, I think. Mm -hmm. Final words. I, I, think, I don't think I have gathered that much of wisdom to give uh, final words, but I, I think I will read. Okay, final um, words for this. So, yes, uh, yes, <laughs> yes, of course. I, I'm pretty sure we'll chat again. And I think it's wonderful to uh, share thoughts um, in a way that we don't usually uh, get to, even though we do uh, chat a uh, fair bit. Um, I think it's one of the main things that we, we talked about is, of course, uh, motivation uh, and being the um, reaching the best, best place that we, we could reach. Um, and I, I, I like to think that all of us do have the capacity, despite our um, societal structural limitation, to reach that space. Right? Uh, and I also have the view that our world today is better off than our ancestral environment. Yeah. Uh, and that means we have the resources we need in order to reach where we want to go. Uh, while structural changes will take time, uh, we can play our part um, and to make the best out of the single life that we have. Um, we should go in that direction and, and try to reach our optimal capacity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I don't think it could have been put in a better way, Selvin. Um, we have a lot of potential, all of us, and we should strive to reach our maximal potential. I too don't think I have gathered enough wisdom to share any final words, but then in my personal experience, I think there have been instances where I, where I exceed my own expectations as far as potential because of hard work. And I'm sure you can relate to that in your own life as well. So yeah, I guess the takeaway for today would be to to challenge ourselves to maximize our potential. And we have made an argument for people who disagree. <laughs> and who <Okay>. would otherwise. <laughs> All right, Salvin, uh, thank you so much for tuning in today. I look forward to the next one. And for everyone watching on YouTube, thank you very much. And look forward, um, I look forward to the next one as well. Bye-bye. Thanks again, bye. I'll end the recording, yeah. Yeah, it's still going on, I think. Okay.